Rohan, home of the Horse Lords, and my heart. From the rolling plains of the Westfold to the babbling mouths of the Entwash, the blood-stained Eyot of the Fords of Eisen to the mighty Spire of the Hornburg, the realm of Rohan has always called to me as a Tolkien enthusiast, a storyteller, and a wargamer. But the jewel of this kingdom is the mighty city of Edoras and the Golden Hall of Meduseld. I see a white stream that comes down from the snows. Where it issues from the shadow of the vale, a green hill rises upon the east. A dyke and mighty wall and thorny fence encircle it. Within there rise the roofs of houses, and in the midst, set upon a green terrace, there stands aloft a great hall of men, and it seems to my eyes that it is thatched with gold. Whether you've joined our Zorpazorp family recently, or you're an old hand familiar with my love of Rohan, this scenery video will be a little different. I have now built the city of Edoras at 28mm scale twice, and with a third build, the mightiest of them all looming on the horizon, I wanted to fully explore my love of this hallowed hall of men, and take you on my terrain building journey so far with this icon of the Lord of the Rings. We'll look at my design and research, my construction techniques, the finished boards, and some never-before-seen time-lapse footage of my largest Edoras build to date. We begin, as we often do, with the union of Tolkien and Jackson. Tolkien provides an incredible level of description of the city of Edoras well beyond that initial quote from Legolas. The palisade wall, the horsehead carvings adorning the buildings, the golden filigree inlaid in Metaseld's timber supports, the hue of the flagstones, the murals on the walls. And every single one of these details was adhered to in exactitude by Peter Jackson, Grant Major and Dan Henner. Tolkien is a great a, is a really a great um, visual writer. So he gives you a huge canvas. Our invented world of Middle Earth had to be kind of thought through from a conceptual stage and then we really have to coordinate with each other so that we have this one look coming through. The Rohan culture always seems to me to be very much based on Norse Scandinavian, Northern Europe civilizations. And, and that comes across in the book, and, and we really didn't want to deviate from that. There was a sort of theory that we should think of them as Vikings of the plains, you know, Vikings without ships, but with horses instead. I actually had the privilege of working under Dan Henna when I was still in the film industry, showing him my Edoras boards and chatting to him about the madness of building the set over 20 years ago remains the absolute highlight of my film career. Strip a, a few away and just dot them around there, couldn't we? I've only ever served you, my lord. The films by Peter Jackson and the incredible design work done by Alan Lee and John Howe thus became the foundations for the designs for my wargaming scenery. I poured over every frame of the films as well as on-set photographs, behind-the-scene footage and the incredible sketches and artwork by Alan. Tolkien describes Edoras very vividly in the books, and um, artists like John Howe and Alan Lee illustrated um, Edoras in the past. It's an area that Tolkien would have been very, very familiar with, and we wanted to create something which would match Tolkien's very evocative description. Two invaluable points of reference were Middle-Earth script to screen by Daniel Falconer and the Lord of the Rings sketchbook by Alan, although I often found myself returning to Tolkien himself. We used a lot of horse motifs in the designs, you know, there's, there's carved horses' heads on the buildings, you know, as part of the decoration of the building, and their horses are, are what they use as the foundation for their society, really. But two-dimensional images can only convey so much. When translating designs into 3D models, I often draw my own sketches, as awful as they are, to help plan out and give things dimensions. But with Edoras, I took it one step further and actually hiked out to the filming location to explore the landscape in person. Well, we're making the trek to Edoras. Uh, it's just there. But we're finding a few obstacles in our way. Number one, big watercourses which are running faster than we were expecting. And number two, midges. So uh, we're gonna head uh, a bit more north and see if we can find a better place to cross. What do they eat when they can't get hobbits? <sighs> 
Last time when we came here on the guided tour, we just pretty much drove up to the top and had a bit of a look around. But one of the advantages of hiking our way up to Edoras is you get to see a lot more of the landscape, including these cool formations up here on our left, which I think could be uh, the barrows of the Kings of the Mark that formed part of the road up to the gate, which was built on this side. So we'll go and check that out in a bit more detail. So here at the base of Mount Sunday, you can see the major rock face up behind me. We are at the location where they built a small segment of the gatehouse and the wall extending in either direction. Of course, it's all been removed now, but you can still see a little trace of it on the hillside. There is just the remnant of a channel flowing along the slope of the hill face. And uh, we've even got one tiny little piece of foundation left from the building of the stone that hasn't been covered over with grass. Now, let's head on up the mountain and find ourselves the summit. Well, here we are at the summit of Edoras. And the trend of winter being a hell of a lot colder has continued, but we've also got a fuckload of low cloud. Last time we were here, it was sunny and beautiful, and now we've got all these gorgeous clouds clinging to the mountains around us, making for a pretty gloomy and uh, pretty moody, moody spectacle, which uh, adds a, a whole other level to this beautiful hiking experience. So right here at the top of Edoras is the stone plinth where Meduseld sat and I'm standing where Eowyn would have stood as she watched Aragorn and company approach from the hills below. Down behind me we can see the stairs where uh, the Rohan Royal Guard unceremoniously threw Grimma Wormtongue from the halls of the Mark and as we work our way down the slope is the path that would have been lined with stables and thatch barns that make up the inner city of Edoras. In many of the filming locations, absolutely nothing remains, and that's almost true here at the top of Mount Sunday, but we do have one tiny little piece of rebar that was uh, plumbed straight into the rockwork to uh, make sure that the 150 km hour winds didn't rip the whole of Metaseld straight off the top of the hill. Now, did I really need to hike out to Mount Sunday to build this terrain? Well, probably not for the boards we're looking at today, although it certainly helped with design. But for the third installment in this series, yes. Absolutely yes, so I'm gonna let you all stew on that. So with all that research and design in place, it was time to begin crafting. Now I will sort of give the small caveat here that a lot of this footage is quite a few years old now. This isn't a new project that I'm doing, so some of this uh, some of this video work isn't kind of to my current standard. But I thought this was worth sharing for you, particularly as I gather my thoughts as I look to creating uh, the latest iteration and the final installment of the Edoras chapter in my wargaming scenery career. Now, as I've mentioned, this board was made twice already, with both builds focusing on the gate and the lower city, and we can break up those builds into some distinct phases. Landscaping and contouring, creating the hard structures, building the scatter terrain, painting, and applying our ground covers and finishing. In both of these boards, the gatehouse was a huge focal point, and the shaping of the board itself to feel like it was both a realistic representation of the sloping hillsides of Edoras, whilst maintaining a playable surface, was a really important consideration. I opted for a gradual slope that I carved and sanded into the hillside leading up to the gatehouse, and then kept the region inside the wall relatively flat, apart from a section of escarpments that continues rising with the road to hint at the higher rock face beyond. Beyond. As no buildings are placed beyond the palisade, this also allows the barrows and that front region with the roadway to be scenically detailed to a really high finish. This landscaping process is simply cutting away large chunks of foam with a blade, sanding wherever necessary, and then smoothing the whole landform out by applying some modelling compound or filler, which is a cellulose fibre plaster mixture like Sculptor Mold. As I sculpt the landforms, I begin to bring in the foundation of the palisade. These are simply sections of extruded polystyrene that are cut in a shape to wind their way down the hillside, forming that rocky foundation. On both the builds, I opted to have these fully built into the board to achieve a really high level of realism. This choice enables us to sculpt landforms right up to the rock face and blend those joins with filler and then eventually grass and flocks, which makes the palisade feel very seated within their environment, 
rather than loose scatter terrain sitting on a gaming board. It just really creates a fantastic realistic looking finish. But a huge long wall can create some pretty huge gameplay problems as I discovered after the first build. So when I built Edoras the second time, I made some removable sections that look like they've been blown apart by enemy siege weapons. I talk a lot about modularity of design on this channel, and this second Edoras build was no exception. To build such a large board to such a high degree of finish is a huge investment, so you want to ensure you get maximum replayability. When I was marking out my palisade wall sections and designing the shape of my landforms, I ensured that the edges of each 2x4 section could be aligned in the same way to create a range of different configurations. Once I was happy with the general layout of the land, I began work on the hard structures, starting with the upper palisades, the gatehouse, and the towers. These all have foundations of extruded polystyrene with a brickwork pattern that is simply carved in with a pen. Then the structures themselves are a combination of balsa wood, modeling timbers, and coffee stirrers of different widths and thicknesses. As a general rule, start with your larger beams to build the core structures and then add your paneling. For timber planks, really thin timbers will certainly more look more realistic at this scale. I also used my rotary tool to score and chip away at larger beams as I assembled them to create a really weathered and beaten look. These structures have been sitting out of the elements for over 500 years by the time of the War of the Ring, so they should look suitably aged. With the first three towers done, I moved on to the upper palisade. This is simply a whole lot of dowel rod of varying diameters getting carved to a point at different heights. The best way to get this done efficiently is to make a whole heap of spikes in batch lots, then glue them together in small straight sections so you can easily assemble them following the curve of the wall. Each section is held together by horizontal beams and the spike at either end is longer at the base and then mounted down into the foam foundation. With the walls complete, the only defensive structure left was the gatehouse itself, which was made in the same way as the main towers, but I used some railroad roofing tiles to get that perfect shingle look. I kept all the towers fully removable as well to make for easier storage and transport. The final part of detailing was to add some plaster rock molds and shape the rocky escarpment at the rear of the board, building this across two pieces to once again ensure some different gameplay as those 2x4s were moved around. The game board is then done for now and it's time to work on our scatter terrain. When I built Edoras the first time around, some of the buildings were a little large, so in this second iteration, I designed a set of pieces of varying sizes, allowing a lot of different configurations. They all had to be fully enterable for maximum gameplay and really convey the feeling of village life without being too cluttered. The construction method for the large buildings is relatively similar. First, the main shape is mocked up out of some foam core board, including any doors or entrances. This substructure is then clad in a timber, either in sheets of balsa that are carved with a pattern or in individual planks. The directions and widths of these planks can be changed between buildings and adding extra details like cross beams and braces can add extra ornamentation for more points of difference. The roofing structure is made in the same way with large wooden braces added to the ends of the roof lines carved with horse heads and various details. I use a higher density modeling timber for these parts for some added strength. The thatch is then made from teddy bear fur from a fabric store that is sealed with diluted PVA glue. The best way to get a really varied looking city is to create a real range of buildings. I went for several smaller dwellings, a large mead hall, a stable, several sheds, workshops, crops, and some fences. By varying the footprint of the building, having doors in different places, having a large L shape or some crenellations like you can see in my stable, it really creates for some fantastic varied gameplay. So with our city built, the hard yards are done. It's time to throw down some paint and flock and get rolling some dice. The first step is to give everything a big prime in a dark neutral brown. I use a foam safe spray so that I don't have to worry about damaging the surface of the polystyrene. Next, the ground gets a series of dry brushes in light browns and greens with a final bone highlight. This ground surface will be mostly covered by flock, so these dry brushes are very rough, but it just gives us a bit of safety if we want to have some patchy areas or light coverage of our ground coverings. The various stone foundations can be painted using my stone painting guide that I'll link in the description below, and then it's onto our wooden buildings. The key here is 
age. These buildings should be weathered and sun bleached, so we don't want anything to look too clean. Using cheap craft paints, I build up a series of dry brush layers using a mix of burnt sienna and burnt umber, then straight burnt sienna, then blending in some yellow ochre, and then some bone to finish. You essentially want to build up a nice profile of graduating tones that leaves the deeper wooden tones in the shadows and a nice pine color in the mid-tones. With those tones established, a really heavy wash of brown and then some green inks will nicely blend and weather that timber and then finish it off with a final dry brush of a bright white bone to give it that sun-kissed sparkle. For the thatch, we simply layer a series of dry brushes, moving from yellow ochre to bone white to get a really nice graduation of aged thatch coloring. With our buildings painted, it's onto the final phase, our flocks and ground covers. Now there is nothing more uniquely Rohan than the swaying prairie grass of central Otago in New Zealand. The scenes of the three hunters chasing the Urukai across the plains are some of the most stunning sequences from the trilogy. To try and capture that feeling at a scenic level was quite a personal challenge. Again, this comes back to research. I looked at a lot of footage. I visited the plains of Rohan myself to get a real grasp for that landscape. Although this build doesn't feature the stunning schist rock formations, the grass is the same, and I'm looking forward to doing a Plains of Rohan board uh, on the channel here in the future. Across the two boards, I used two different styles. The first pass using much more of a yellow prairie grass look, the second using more of a summer green. For the Rohan aesthetic, I prefer the first, but regardless of the look, the overall process is the same. You simply change the tones of the grass you're applying. For the Rohan color profile, I used predominantly dead grass with patches and layers of spring, and for the green aboard, I used predominantly blends of summer and then brought in some spring. First up, I made a selection of grass tufts and applied those in mostly six millimeters all along the edges of the paths next to the buildings and dotted sporadically through the hills and plains. This tussock grass is a huge part of the look so feel free to be really heavy handed outside the front of the palisade where you don't have to put down any of the buildings but I leave the area inside free of tufts to allow for our scatter terrain. Then starting with my two millimeter grass I covered the entire service to build up a solid coverage platform working straight into a layer of PV. VA. Then I used spray adhesive and I layered passes of 4mm and 6mm grass to create a really nice natural variation of height across the board, particularly around the front of the walls. The trick with static grass is to be sure that you break up any uniformity with different grass blends. All of the different length grasses from each colour family are also a subtly different tone, so they create a lovely natural variation in both height and colour. So there we have my journey with Edera so far. If you'd like to see either of these boards in detail, I've linked the original older videos in the description, as well as an epic battle report played out on the larger of the two boards with a ridiculous amount of Urukai besieging the forces of Rohan. But where to from here? Well, I think it's fairly obvious. There is one pretty huge omission from my Edoras collection, and that is the Golden Hall of Meduseld and the Upper City. With the release of the new game's workshop terrain, kits designed specifically on the part of the set that was built up the top of Mount Sunday, these are the perfect tools to put together a truly awesome scenic display. But before that project can begin, we have a white city to finish. For those of you who have been following the progress of our COVID-19 community build, fear not, we have more Minas Tirith updates on the way. Obviously with the release of 40k 9th edition, that's been a huge focus for me, but there is lots of Middle Earth content in the pipeline, especially focusing on Minas Tirith, so thank Thank you so much to all our Middle Earth viewers for your patience. If you're enjoying everything I do here on the channel, feel free to check out my Patreon. My supporters over there are the main reason I can come to work every day and make videos for you guys. So thank you so much to them, and I will see you on the next one right here on Zorpazorp Gaming. Cheers, guys.